this this episode we have a topical episode about the Tanzu Application Service 3.0, recently released, and we have we've got uh, we've got we've got a, a nice guest lined up who actually knows what they're talking about in detail. They've organized their thoughts. They figured out the best way to present them for maximum knowledge transfer. Why don't you introduce <laughs> yourself, guest? Uh, hi, I'm uh, Nick Kuhn. I'm a technical marketing architect uh, working on Tansy Application Service and uh, this new product as well, the Application Service Adapter for Tansy Application Platform. Ah, yes. That, that's, that, now, is that, is that in the 3.0 release or is that still in, uh, uh, in, in sort of beta or whatever release? I forget. Uh, uh, the uh, the adapter is still in beta, but uh, ah, yes. keep your keep your eyes peeled for uh, when it goes generally available here soon. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Well, so before we get into, I mean, this is the 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 three O, which would imply it's the third major release of mm-hmm. of the application service here. But you know, for for not everyone, unfortunately, you know, for for their own uh, excitement in entertainment, is familiar with the Tanzu application service, previously known as Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Why don't you give us, uh, like, 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 what is, as we say here inside Taz, like, what's, what's going on with this thing? Sure. So, like, at, at a very high level, you can think of uh, Tain's Application Service as a, uh, what we call a platform as a service, or kind of like a application runtime. Uh, so that's kind of a, a higher level abstraction than what you see with maybe, like, a Kubernetes, which is, most people call it a container, container as a service, container runtime. Mm. Uh, so it's kind of higher up the stack. Um, as you uh, kind of mentioned before, this this is the artist formerly known as Pivotal Cloud Foundry or Pivotal Application Service. Uh, a lot of people still call it PCF just because that's kind of what stuck with them. Um, but it, it is a distribution or release of Cloud Foundry, and uh, that it you know there is a something called the Cloud Foundry Foundation, and there are multiple kind of certified distributions produced by various companies uh, of this, uh, you know, software suite um, or, you know, kind of foundation of software. Uh, But, you know, it's all kind of geared towards the, uh, you know, elevating the developer experience uh, and really kind of um, abstracting developers away from uh, infrastructure toil and and, and fiddling with all the different bits that they can kind of get lost in, uh, you know, this day and age, especially with, if, you know, if you look at kind of like building your own Kubernetes platform and, you know, exploring the uh, the CNCF and all the, you know, all the different, you know, ways you can get lost for uh, just figuring out how to get ingress or certificates or, or things of that nature. So, and, and you, go ahead. T- 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 tell me uh, how, what you think of this, Ben, but I think, I think that, that, uh, uh, that the times of application services, I don't know what you, what you call like a classic PaaS. That that is like it. It essentially tries to and and does pretty well at removing from application developers the need to really do very much infrastructure thinking, right? Like all of the sort of infrastructure is there are still things there to do, like um, I don't know, explain how to connect together different components of your applications, sort of command that it gets done. But you don't really have to like do it you just deem it so <laughs> like like you would sort of expect from a, a self-service platform yeah it's really really powerful i mean um first of all it's very mature and very trustworthy so you know exactly what's going to happen when you're issuing your commands against uh tons of application service and um Nick and I, we've both been on the other side of the fence, if you like. So so I I was in the field as a consultant helping folks to learn how to use um, Tanzu Application Service. And um, in many large organizations, you know, folks like uh, like banks and automotive companies and that sort of thing. um, And they really, really get it. You know, they really dig the fact that yeah, a developer can have a lot of control over exactly where their application is going to run. And I know for for Nick, you came from a a, a client of um, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, didn't you? And you yeah. you came to us from there. So I'm presuming you had a similar experience with the folks that you were working with. Uh, yeah. So um, I I worked at a, a large retailer previously um, uh, before coming to VMware, but um, you know. With this kind of, first of all, from the developer experience that we talk about that that command and you know, that's really this this command called CF push where it focuses on going from source code 
to production or source code URL, uh, you know, within minutes. And kind of before that, what folks saw, if we go back in time, kind of before um, the, the Kubernetes landscape, you had to go like fight with all these legacy kind of infrastructure application service servers and, you know, fight to get, you know, your code pushed to a server and, uh, you know, work with networking teams to get load balancing and certificates and, and things of all this nature. And with CF push that enabled developers just to take that code and the platform would, would upload it. Uh, it would, you know, put it in a runtime, a container, uh, you know, um, back in the day when Cloud Foundry came out, that was kind of a newer, newer thing for most people. Uh, but it would automatically build a container for you uh, based on best practices called uh, a build packs. Um, and we kind of see that that build pack concept carried through today through multiple technologies. Uh, and that's kind of was all handled on the, on behalf of the developer. They didn't have to worry about doing any of that. And then it gets promoted up the chain and, you know, gets into the routing tier where um, load balancing gets set up, uh, auto scaling gets set up, uh, certificates and all of that is just handled on the by the by the platform for the developer and they don't have to think about any of that and that's a very common um it's a great story you know uh, if we look back a few years and we look in currently too that's you know it's still kind of hard to do even with um some of the newer technologies as well out of the box so it's, it's very powerful from a developer perspective but also from an operation perspective uh there's this little uh handy infrastructure uh, as code technology called bosch uh, which really enables, uh, you know, customers or, or clients of a Tanzu application service to upskill their operations game because then uh, Bosch will uh, automatically deploy Cloud Foundry uh, on pretty much any infrastructure as a service as choice, whether that's vSphere, AWS, Google, or Azure. And so the, the operations team don't really have to um, worry about configuring that or, or building a bunch of, you know, bespoke Terraform to get their platform built. Uh, so that's all kind of handled uh, by default by by Bosch, and once you know that platform gets built, it it will also take care of it from like a day one to day two to day ninety nine or uh, day a thousand, where it will monitor all these components that it built, and if there's an upgrade or a CV like a CVE remediation, you can go and and, and do a full like OS rebuild or a, a rebuild of that specific item. Bosch will do that whole rebuild and repay process um, kind of out of the box and also in a, in a manner that does not take the, the platform down and keeps it up and running the whole time. So uh, at my previous employer, we we rebuilt our platforms at least four times a year, if not more, um, from like, you know, that golden uh, image that we had with Bosch called that stem cell. So it's, uh, it's very powerful from both a developer and operator perspective of really kind of up, up up leveling your developers and operators to to just reduce a lot of complexity and uh, really get folks uh, focusing on what's really matters is you know how can we make our business logic process you know how, how do we produce more business logic faster to, to get features out to our our actual end customers yeah you know I always think like if uh, always like like I'm I'm walking around while I'm cutting up garlic and things and always mm -hmm. thinking here but when it does come into my mind, uh, like I, I think, I think, uh, you know, to, the point of the Tanzu application service is that if, if you don't need to, or want to build your own platform, here is one you can use <laughs> that, right. that is all integrated together. And of course, uh, as, as, as one of our coworkers, uh, former coworkers used to say, you know, you've got to install the cloud. So there's some work that has to be done to get the infrastructure in place. But with that, with that baseline of work, as you were going through, you know, like you, you kind of set up the way networking is done, the way storage is done, the way middleware is managed and scaled up and down and uh, and provisioned out to people, so to speak, how quotas are uh, done, like all, all the kind of controls you would expect. And uh, it's just sort of ready there with defaults uh, to use if, if you don't feel the need or, uh, or desire to customize things and build it on your own or, or use, you know, one of the parallel, uh, the, the other sort of platformy thing we have is the Tanzu application platform, which is more of a, uh, uh, an integrated toolkit for building that platform on your own if, uh, if you're into that rather than having this, you know, black box is always a negative term. But this uh, this this functional uni unit is that? Mm -hmm. uh, can we see if that one works, Ben? What do you think, uni unit? Is that is that going to fly? <laughs> it sounds like 
part of uh, an educational establishment. Ah, uh, yes. Not... Yeah, there you go. Uni unit. <laughs> I'm going to stop saying that word because yeah. I'm I'm not sure. That's a little too science fiction for me. I feel like I've stumbled in some sort of like Tumblr aesthetic blog that's uh, going over <laughs> things. I'm not quite sure there. Well, uh, so there's, there's you know, uh, a, a pretty uh, large install for uh, for Taz out there. So I'm sure people are, you know, they, they kind of watch the, the versions coming out and, and the new features there. But so it's always interesting to see what's in a new release. And uh, so we have we have uh, the Tanzo application 3.0 out now. Now, you know, tell me how you want to start. This is all sorts of ways to go over the release notes, as it were. We got right. you can you can go item by item. Maybe there's a big theme. There's also like the uh, the kind of commercial side that that's always interesting. What what people are doing with it. What's what when when you I'm sure you have spent a fair amount of time figuring out the perfect way to represent this material. What's right. the part where you're like, I got to go edit this, and I'm kind of looking forward to it. What what part are you excited about? Let's start with that. Um, let's see here. So, I think every theme so far, uh, we focus on rolling out new developer features and operator features. Mm. Um, so those are two uh, kind of like two different um areas that I kind of focus on. You know, uh, obviously trying to get all the developer features and, and kind of read about them and 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 you know trying to figure out what I'm going to, you know, maybe potentially demo or, or that type of thing. And then the operator features too, uh, they don't quite demo as well because, you know, it's hard to fit them in a short video, but they have a, a lot of impact as well. So if we want to kind of go through the developer features first and maybe then like kind of go, we can dive to the operator features. Yeah. Family, uh, as well, I, that would work out. So I think, you know, having actually done you know, worked with Taz in the past, you're of course most excited about the working with Taz part, the actual features, yeah. which is good. And it's true, you know, it can be difficult to show operation stuff because it's kind of like, it's kind of like maybe showing off like a, a robot, like vacuum cleaner. You're just sort of like, that's what it does. And it vacuums. And and like, you know, what, what you don't see is someone not having to spend all their time vacuuming on their own. It just automates stuff for you, and yeah, uh, just you so, just get a clean floor all the time. Which is, exactly. Like, so unless you unless you had like a five year time lapse video, you wouldn't yeah. really appreciate uh, what was going on there. But anyhow, how about the developer stuff? What's what's in three O for that the developers will get excited about? Uh, let's see here. Uh, so uh, the first feature we can talk about. Um, so there's been some uh, improvements in Apps Manager, and that's kind of the uh, GUI interface for the platform. And one kind of big thing that's kind of, it's kind of dev and operator-y, uh, I, I guess, but uh, Apps Manager now lets you search for like specific users or really has a user search within the platform. Mm. Uh, so that's kind of big when you have these big companies that have, you know, potentially thousands of developers in, in, in the platform. And if you're trying to, you know, uh, like kind of space administrators or, or org administrators are trying to, to kind of add or remove certain permissions or, or you know, kind of, kind of do some permissions management uh, within the UI. Uh, that's kind of a big deal to to be able to find, uh, you know, to be able to search for a user and find it. So that's a that's a big one in terms of just uh, helping everyone keep everything managed uh, type thing. Um, another really interesting feature that's coming out is the um, the ability to kind of share routes between spaces. So Cloud Foundry mm. has this. Um, uh, kind of like hierarchy built in. So you have the organization, Cloud Foundry organizations and Cloud Foundry spaces. So uh, an organization is usually tied to like a line of business and a space is usually a team within that. So um, within our customers and really in any company, you see, uh, you know, over time, there's kind of like people change and reorganization where, you know, team A moves to team B or, you know, the, the application that team A supported is now moving to team B. Uh, so this feature really allows applications to be moved around within the people structure uh, without taking downtime. So before this, you, they had to, you know, do like a full, like redeploy that, you know, like for say, we're going to move application A to team B. We're going to have to redeploy application A into team, into team B space and then take down the old app route oh, and right. move it over. And like, kind of like there's like unnecessary uh, outages, I guess, really just to, to deal with people changes. So, this allows us to share spaces and do that that kind of application migration ownership change essentially without taking things down. Uh, so that's you know that's good in terms of like you know, people don't have to schedule change for tickets or anything like that. Just right. To change right. a ownership type thing. 
I mean, I mean, to use to use the word, I think is a little ironic because it's trying to specify literalness. There, there used to be, you know, where your app run was like in a in was physically defined in mm-hmm. in a, in a space or an org, and now it's more virtually, <laughs> like like it's not it's not hard coded into that that space, for example, so you can just easily move it over without having to sort of recon you know, redo everything and and reinstall it. Which which seems delightful. I mean, you know, that's that's one interesting thing to 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 note about uh, the the like cloud foundry way of thinking about things is the way with you know the way as as you were going over it, it divides up its cloud so to speak is based more on people <laughs> like like the organization structure you have and the teams of people doing things rather than the the infrastructure that it's running on which has mm-hmm. that. Uh, interesting effect there in comparison to kind of like a Kubernetes or another way of, of thinking about dividing up your uh, platform. Yeah. That, yeah. So that, it definitely has hard. Uh, so Tain's application service and cloud foundry has a like very hard multi-tenant scheduler. So you can, you can do these kind of organization, like these people, like um, I guess delineation mm. uh, without really having the, works have to worry about like the blast radius of the technology versus if you look at Kubernetes, you have this debate of, are we going to give every team like their own cluster? Does their own application get their own cluster? So you kind of have like this weird, you know, debate of trying to organize that, uh, you know, you have the container scheduler sprawl of trying to meet the people requirements versus, right, uh, right. you know, that's something I think that Cloud Foundry uh, that got really got right really well it doesn't really get a whole lot of credit for really to press about but the uh, orgs and spaces really help help that problem not not be a problem i guess <laughs> they help address it that's yeah. exactly yeah. so so what else is going on in, in the the developer side there uh so we have some improvements to the app auto scaler um so within the uh within the apps manager you can now um toggle the app auto scaler uh to scale up uh instances just you know by a you know set number so before the app autoscaler would watch an application and say oh it's busy let's scale it up one instance at like a set interval but now developers can say hey my application when it gets busy i need to scale it by more than one so i'm going to scale it by two or five or ten ten instances mm-hmm. of the application and that's really just to address uh like if you're going to get a big burst of workload like some you know some kind of event coming on some kind of sale something of that nature that those applications can scale up and meet their SLA without, you know, without too much issue. So that, that really helps make the auto scaler um, to handle, you know, big, large, un, you know, bursts of traffic, whether they be expected or unexpected. Um, and that was in, in our previous release, 213, that was in the, in, in the CLI configuration only, but in 213 now it's in the nice, pretty UI that people can just click buttons and, you know, have, have feel great about type thing. Um, now you can feel great two ways, yes, not just exactly. one. And you can see it too. It's, the, the power of seeing something in the GUI is, uh, is always nice. Uh, another another interesting feature or something to call out is the uh, integrated Windows authentication support uh, for the .NET Core build pack. So uh, one thing to do mention is that we, we do actually support Windows applications a lot on the platform, which is, uh, I guess, atypical from other other services. Uh, so we do run .NET Core and .NET Legacy or .NET Framework. Uh, sorry, .NET Framework, which is kind of the legacy uh, like Windows type uh, uh, framework uh, in the platform. Uh, so we've rolled out the integrated Windows authentication support for .NET Core uh, build pack only. Um, so this will allow those applications that are running the platform or that couldn't run on the platform uh, that because they required IWA um, to now come onto the platform. So I'm kind of thinking these these applications are still maybe on this, maybe a legacy application server because they're stuck with this, you know, config. Uh, we can now accept those onto the platform and anyone with uh, these these type of applications should probably celebrate because then they probably don't have to worry about maintaining a legacy application server anymore. They can go onto a, a modern app runtime. Uh, so that's, uh, to me, pretty exciting uh, for those developers. And as you say, for for several years now, I mean, uh, like .NET and Windows have been a pretty good first class citizen in on yep. uh, in Taz, which which does like I mean I I come across people frequently who uh, 
they really like it for their Windows workloads versus versus running, you know, on, on newer things like Kubernetes or other container stuff. So that's that's nice. I guess that would, you know, with that, you, as you were saying, you can widen it up to uh, older applications or applications that have to use older services, yeah. yep. <laughs> so, to, so to speak, which that sounds good. Cool. Uh, and then I think the last one we uh, we'll cover on the developer space is the um, fair CPU entitlement. Um, so that seems kind of, uh, I guess, you know, bizarre without explaining it. But uh, it, it talks about really about the the underlying container scheduler uh, of the platform, which is called Diego. And this feature now allows um, basically better use of the, the CPU scheduler within the platform. So when you when you enable this this feature. It, it basically prevents um, noisy applications on the platform from taking over, like taking all shares of um, of of the CPU from from the cell that they're running on. So it basically mm. uh, allows the CPU entitlements to be um, uh, kind of honored. And if you have a bad actor, they're going to kind of be throttled and not allowed to take over everything. Um, so that's kind of uh, one of the kind of I guess things to note as the, the that the container scheduler in cloud foundry diego was always very like memory centric from scheduling so this is kind of some of these bringing in some new cpu scheduling uh, efforts as well so uh, that should help out some folks that really you know when they're at scale helping to ensure that cpus kind of uh fair across the board and you don't have you don't have certain applications just you know hogging hogging a cell or multiple cells at a time so that should in and, and from a developer, that should basically result in predictable or more predictable CPU usage on the platform. Well, developers are probably a lot like my son. He's, you know, 11 and very interested in fairness. I, I don't know if yeah. you've ever experienced this, but they, they, he, he is both a fantastic lawyer. He can tell you how you have the minutia of how you've worded something incorrectly and that we should now word it to be extremely precise. And then he is, uh, he's currently uh, getting his third doctorate in fairness, I think is what he's pursuing. So even with chips, is this with a, happy. Is this with a specialism in screen time or any particular <laughs> aspect? <laughs> Absolutely. I think, I think that might be his, uh, his minor if they have yeah. that in postgraduate work. <laughs> or or is it a doctorate of it, right? Like, yeah, yeah. He's, he's pursuing multiple degrees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I think this uh, I think this list Nick is great. I, there's some stuff in there that I I think is really cool. I mean, it, clearly doubling down on that sort of ability to share things, to scale things, uh, making the administration easier. These are and these are all in the in the apps manager side of the house. So these are all things that developers will see and be able to. These are knobs and whistles that they can tweak and tweet <laughs> right yeah T tweak and tweet i, I, I got... well, yes <laughs> brilliant uh, yeah okay um let's let's cover a few operator features real quick uh well, as we kind of go down the list so uh one really interesting thing uh, and we see this with um when you get to a certain scale and a lot of our customers have but when you think about like you know resources within the cloud you know you think about cpu disk and memory uh, you know that seems pretty pretty straightforward but when you talk about a container runtime or application runtime you also have this thing called logs right and most of these platforms don't really have any kind of quota or anything of that nature and when you start to have you know thousands or tens of thousands of applications um, running on a platform the log output could be, um, you know, substantial. So, you know, the Cloud Foundry uh, platform has a, a very extensive like logging backend system that takes logs, you know, collects and aggregates all these logs, and then you you can it can send them to various sources or multiple sources, you know, third party sources or or whatever for uh, you know metrics and log aggregation, and you know to to, to to, to really help like when you get to this in this stage of microservices and, and 12 factor applications the you need sre teams to basically debug the death stars of microservices that you built and logs and metrics are kind of critical to that so we see like the log uh, egress coming out of our platforms uh being you know you can easily see like hundreds of thousands of logs per second in some some of these larger foundations 
Uh, so we definitely over the years a- implemented things to, you know, kind of level that and, and have that be more predictable. But th- this, this, this next feature is, is really giving operators the ability to apply um, log quotas now as well uh, at the space level. So you, you basically have to have this contract with your app teams to say, you're going to get a quota on, you know, uh, disk and memory, and now you can get a quote on logs, because if you if you if the app teams kind of write something that that's logging poorly and it's a very busy app, it could you know, it could be very bad in terms of it, it consuming that on a third party service that you pay per log, right? Uh, so this is something uh, that we're you know this the uh, the log quote is being introduced um, that you can do at the space level to basically give um, allow operators to give <laughs> their dev teams a quota and you know kind of give them uh, force a practice uh, of um, better coding and and making sure they log what's needed and you know don't don't you know don't fire something up in de- debug mode and leave it and that type of thing so uh, you know on, on the blog I entitled it uh, mute noisy application logs but it's really kind of um, getting logging quotas and ensuring that um, you don't have a few apps just, you know, spamming the logging system essentially. And, and this would also gives a mechanism too to, to find uh, these teams that have maybe poor logging practices because they'll blow out the log quota and be like, Hey, uh, team a, you know, why are you logging, you know, 20,000 logs a second or something of that nature? Can you, can we look at, you know, your log statements and maybe, maybe, you know, do a little bit of cleanup per se. So that's something that you don't really see until you get to a certain scale. And then um, that's a problem that needs to be addressed pretty quickly once you get to that scale. So that's kind of like one of my, I guess, let's call it a flagship operator feature. Uh, and I, I, I think it will end up saving, you know, hopefully a lot of money for our customers as they are able to uh, kind of clean up some of their logging practices and, and uh, um, reduce just the back end logging uh constraint and you know especially if they're sent it to a third party that type of thing yeah as you're noting there's there's several features that are around uh when you're operating at high scale small things add up if there are many of them mm-hmm. it, which which uh uh that's a good truism for you but that, that is nice maybe also it would encourage uh, briefer logs instead of logging everything as yes. you were saying that's yeah. that's always uh uh can be a bit of an annoyance yeah, Let's definitely see. for those who have to read them. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think it's good as well because it's that sort of feedback round that, that wasn't really there before around sort of, yeah, this this one is a bit too chatty. You know, it's, uh, it's a chatty Cathy that we've got on the uh, on the platform here. And, um, you, you know, when you translate that into a dollar value, it, it can add up quite quickly, can't it? So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm in no doubt that it's been a popular request, and, a, and it will be a popular feature. That yes, I and um, I, I there are a few other features too in 3.0 that that target logging as well, but they're more on the um, back end logging system. So I'm not going to get down into the those features as well. We have a a, a full kind of GA blog on Tanzu blog for um, for the release. So we have a couple other features too that that will help, you know, that are all targeting that, that logging problem to, to just reduce that overhead and, and help our operators out there as well. So I, I think I, I don't want to go through every operator feature just because there's a lot of them, uh, but maybe we can go down into, um, I want to touch a little bit on the Tanes of application service for windows updates, um, just because I want to call that out again. Uh, so, We've got two two features coming out for that. Um, so our Bosch agents are now going to restart automatically on our window cell. So on a side note, Diego runs full in in a full Windows server mode to, to support the the .NET framework uh, code bases because you have to you have to run that on Windows servers per you know micro, Microsoft licensing uh, agreements. So you know that whole ecosystem of Bosch and that infrastructure's code process we built and, and runs kind of as a first class citizen for windows and that not many people have that, uh, but we're making some improvements around how Bosch, the Bosch agent works on the cell. So it will automatically reboot and restart now. So when a cell, if a cell died or, or restarted, 
uh, an operator have to kind of go in there and manually wake it up, so to speak. So that that's been fixed now. So that's that's a big win for uh, the Windows uh, Windows operators of the house. Um, and then I think another thing to let's to, to talk about. Uh, I hinted at it before of really kind of the concept of, of platform extensions, and um, that is this this application service adapter uh, for Tanzo application platform. Uh, it's really uh, a new project within the Cloud Foundry Foundation called Karifi. Um, so that is kind of an, a, the next evolution of efforts for Cloud Foundry running on top of Kubernetes. And this 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 um, this product or this adapter, it's been out in beta for I think since since January of this year and. The mm-hmm. team's been releasing a, a, a release every every month, and it sh- should go to GA here soon. But it's definitely, I think, something that we're targeting for some of our our, our operators and our, our core customers who want to kind of uh, dip their toes in, in the Kubernetes water, but don't really want to lose everything they have already today. And and that's you know another really exciting thing going on. Um, it, it allows your your developers that you have today to maintain the the, the CF CLI or the CF push experience uh, on top of Kubernetes and Tanzo application platform. Um, so that's definitely uh, something to keep uh, your eyes peeled about as well as we continue to make pro- progress there. So so tell us tell us a little bit about that. Like what what is I mean I'm not too familiar with it, but what what is how does it work? What's the layering there? Sure. So, um, if you if we if we talk about TAP, right, or Tanzo Application Platform, mm-hmm. sorry for using acronyms, but it's 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 uh, my nature, I guess. Uh, you, you take a Kubernetes cluster, right, and then you layer uh, Tanzo Application Platform on top of it. Uh, there's some some tooling to uh, kind of that's wrapped in the Tanzu CLI to make that experience easier to to install those packages. And once you once you have a, a Kubernetes cluster with Tanzu application platform running on it, it is just another Tanzu CLI package to install that installs the the application service adapter. So it, it's making use of some of the some of the bits of Tanzu application platform like Tanzu build service or Contour and Cert Manager. Uh, so you know you know part of that new platform stack, as you will, and it's also has additional APIs that it's running to. Um, to represent the Cloud Foundry APIs and, and CLI interface within native Kubernetes constructs like the um, the CRDs or the custom resource definitions. Um, right. So that's at a high level what it is. But from a developer perspective, they still have that, you know, they can still use their existing pipelines and their kind of, you know, developer flow where they push to a uh, Cloud Foundry API, uh, you know, that's compliant. So that's, that's where... Um, that that adapter's going right that makes sense so you have the same experience as a developer whether you're using like a a, ton, a cloud foundry based thing or, or a platform and it, it's not fully compatible with the the existing set so it's you know it's i i kind of view it as like a cloud foundry light or a tens of application service light uh because it doesn't have that full feature stack yet but a lot of the core features have been have been you know have been re uh, I guess uh, re implemented and reproduced on the uh, Tanzo application platform side with that with that adapter. Makes sense. So what else is going on in the release? Uh, so two two things to call out that are like I guess we'll call them program related items, um, and I, one of those might be a. Uh, uh, prevalent with with the version, but we've adopted a new version format from like the the Taz program. Uh, so we're going to roll out, or we'll, we'll we'll be rolling out, and we'll be uh, you know targeting the, this concept of a major minor patch plus metadata version. So before um, we were rolling out like two dot x, like two dot one, two dot two, two dot three, and we've been on that two dot series for quite some time and we were basically you know releasing all this new major feature content on on the minor patch stream uh so now as of tanzu application service 3.0 we're adopting this new release and uh, 
approximately every six, every six months. We'll, you know, we're going to target a new major release. So we'll rev that to 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, that type of thing. Um, and um, that frees up that minor um, branch to kind of be like an ad hoc, um, as needed um, um, patch for breaking changes, that type of thing. Like there's a some kind of vulnerability that needs to come out where we need to introduce something to fix something, but it might break something. Um, that's kind of what the, the minor patch is for. Uh, sorry, the minor track. And then the patch track is is just for non-breaking patch changes. Uh, and we've also, the, the metadata flag has been added to um, track what releases are going to be long-term support or not. So uh, from a program level, uh, uh, we introduced this concept of long-term support releases for folks who didn't want to upgrade every so often. So we've, you know, previously we had this, this long-term support program, which targeted um, a release about every two years. And then those customers would upgrade about every two years. And then in the meantime, we had a release target every six months. And that was kind of like the fast track. So from, from that perspective, um, we've kind of rebranded the long-term support program to the long-term support track. And then we had the, the, we were keeping the, you know, the fast feature track or the fast release track that, so uh, the long-term support track now is going to be released one, uh, approximately once a year. And then uh, we'll still have that fast feature track every six months. So uh, those, uh, those long-term support track releases will be uh, designated the, with the metadata LTST. So we can easily identify those releases when we're looking back and, you know, looking through the release, not, uh, release um, documents. And, and, you know, if you're looking at Tanzanet to find, to find an actual, uh, you know, thing to download, it'll be very clearly documented. And those two, those, those changes that the new version format change and the updates to long-term support are really just trying to uh, help customers get features a little bit faster, but still be on that more um, kind of uh, structured uh, cadence where, um, you know, very methodical, you know, the, the, most of these customers are very uh, mature in their uh, platform practices and, um, you know, there's a lot at stake and they don't want to be, you know, rolling out things too frequently. So, um, especially with the, you know, new feature functionality, very, uh, they're very risk averse customers and they, they like to make sure their platforms are, you know, um, stable, stable. Yes. Mission critical and stable. Yeah. And then, and then we were joking about this last week, but you don't fall into the, uh, the Java versioning problem where you're, you're a 25 year old technology still on the, uh, the first version yeah, one, one, yeah, one exactly. point X that they're operating yeah, on. Yeah. You can actually advance beyond that, which is nice. And then, I mean, to point out the obvious implicit in that is that there is a long-term support program <laughs> for, right. for people who want to guarantee that, that stability there, uh, which, which is, uh, nice. Well, what, well, what else is, is there anything else, uh, in the release that's notable? Um, let's see, kind of glanced over some of the operator features, but I guess from a, from a security perspective, well, let's, I want to, I'm going to call this out just cause it's, I, I like saying it, but, uh, jammy jellyfish. Uh, so the jammy jell jellyfish stem cell is, is being rolled out. So if, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, um, it's really about the new version of the Ubuntu operating system. So, um, Ubuntu has very uh, awesome names for their for their operating system releases. So Jammy Jellyfish is Ubuntu 2204, uh, also their long term support release. Uh, so that is being rolled out for for Tanzu Application Service and in Operations Manager as well. So uh, kind of by default, um, there'll be a full operating system level upgrade going from Ubuntu 1604 to Ubuntu 2204. And that's all kind of magically handled by Bosch, but that's kind of a big deal because you know typically when you do a full uh, operating system you know replacement, that may or may not you know you know require a lot of work uh, depending on what you're doing. So that's a that's a big feature too for the for the operator side of the house to just really ensure that uh, we're on that latest uh, OS and uh, everything's ready to go there. Plus, I like saying Jamie Jellyfish, so. <laughs> It's kind of hard not to like, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, and 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 as you're saying, right? Like one of the one of the uh, uh, benefits or promises or whatever of, of Cloud Foundry is like by the nature of how stem cells stem cells are like 
you know, layered and then, and then your actual like, uh, deployments are layered on, uh, on top of that. Like there's a nice separation between the operating system and the higher layers that makes it less painful to, uh, deploy a new operating system than it may be otherwise. Definitely if you were doing all of that on your own, but that's, that sounds good. Well, it seems like the theme is, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's both like the, uh, quieting down all the noisy things. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, and having more control over higher scale stuff uh, that are used in in bigger installs, uh, and and then there's the the sort of like stability that comes with like now there's a big install of things, and we need to have like a multi year sort of plan for how we're gonna handle uh, handle support for that. But also like you know what what's the when you want stability in a platform, it's good to know like the expected release schedule for things kind of like the philosophy of adding in new features and, and releasing them and supporting them, which is kind of implicit in that, that version numbering there or, or behind it. Right. Yes. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to add Ben? I do. I think there's one thing that, that is beautiful about, uh, Tanzo application service and that hasn't changed from a developer's point of view. And that is how it makes you feel. The, the very first time that you get behind that keyboard and you do CF push your app and a few seconds later you get your URL and you can hit it and you know that behind the scenes all all sorts of mountains have been moved to make that happen in such a smooth and predictable way that it's brilliant. And when I was showing clients it, you know, it, it regularly blew people's minds. It was like, okay, this, <laughs> this has now suddenly become really easy. Uh, I like that. I like really easy. Anyone who knows me knows I like that. So I like the fact that that hasn't changed. You know, that is still there, still baked into the, to the platform to this day. And it's still putting smiles on people's faces as they are working through their everyday putting business logic into production problems, you know? So, so I think that is really, really commendable. And I'm very, very pleased that, uh, this version three is coming along and that, um, that we're still investing so much into it as well. I, I really like that. Yeah. I can, I, that reminds me, uh, at my push, uh, my, my first CF push experience. Uh, so sitting in, in a lab with a coworker and this is quite some time ago now, but we, we had, uh, the Tanzu application service installed, you know, at the time it was called uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Uh, we, we got it installed. It took about, you know, four or five hours to, to get installed on top of our vSphere environment. And we were kind of fiddling with the CLI. And so we, we like, you know, we pushed an app and I don't even know what the app was. It was probably, you know, hello world or something. Right. And we got it to, to work and we're like, well, that was, that's awesome. And they're like, all right, What's this thing called CF scale? Like CF, CF scale dash I a hundred that scaled up to a hundred instances and then a hundred instances started. And we're just like that, you know, like not only did you, you get your application running and then you just scaled it up to a hundred instances in a few, you know, minutes. It was just like completely blew our mind. And that was quite some time ago, but yet it's still that, that experience is still, still a hundred percent relevant today. Uh, you know, and the our, you know, the customers of this platform still, you know, get a great that that great experience still lives on and continues to you know has a bright future uh i'm real excited about absolutely there you go if you haven't tried it try it it will blow your mind (laughs) i'm glad you shared the same experience i did i gotta say yeah it's it's really good I, i love it it's really good well speaking of relevancy I'm sure we'll be talking about the Tanzu application service a lot at the spring conference we have coming up. Spring One conference, you know, despite its name One, has actually been around for a while. It's 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 more than a 3.0 product, as I recall. I don't know. The, the spring <laughs> conference has been around for quite some time. I remember going to a very small one way back in the late 2000s, but it's much larger than that now, and uh, it's going to be December 6th to 8th in San Francisco. Uh, and there'll be lots to learn about the Tanzu application service and application yeah. platform and Java and just uh, Spring doing .NET things, programming and uh, doing operations and even a little bit of, uh, I know it's your favorite topic, Vin, digital transformation. You know, you and I, when we hang out, we're always like, let's go talk about digital transformation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we like talking to other people who like talking about that as well, uh-huh. uh, which is always nice. Just get a get a big cup of digital transformation and, and uh, start drinking it. I, I joke, but what, what you know what's meant by that is 
hearing from people who are actually using software and, and uh, building and running their own software to like run their business and their organization in, in new and better ways and uh, changing over to it. Anyhow, that's going to be uh, December 6th to 8th. And if you go to springone.io, we have a fair amount of the sessions posted so you can kind of browse around and look at it. But when, you, uh, when you're there at springone.io and you register for it, if you use the code COTE200, you can get $200 off, which is better than $0 off. Uh, last I checked how math works, so you might as well use that code. And also, being relevant, uh, if you went to tanzutalk.com and uh, looked at the show notes for this episode, we'll link to the blogs that, uh, that, that we mentioned and went over and uh, all the other relevant stuff uh, to take a look at. We'll, we'll have to get a special collection for people who go see the show notes at tanzutalk.com. And uh, with that, uh, do you all have any other final shots, uh, thoughts you want to well, share, whether it's it about like, uh, digital transformation or platforms? It seems like the ideal segue, because I think... Nick, you've got a talk at Spring One as well, haven't you? Yeah, I was oh, just yes. going to mention that. Yeah. So I, if you want to learn more about Tanzu Application Service, uh, I'll be at Spring One giving you a talk about uh, kind of a deep dive. And uh, so, yeah, come check it out for sure. Uh, you'll love to talk about Tanzu Application Service there. And then I, I got one more thing to hopefully close the show out, but I'll, I'll wait till everyone else is finished if, if we're ready. Is it yeah, a I... sing? Are you going to sing? <laughs> no, I, I'm not going to sing. I don't... That, that's no, nobody wants to ever hear me sing. Okay. Maybe for, uh, maybe for next out. episode. I mean, I think all you, you, we just put a vocoder on it or whatever that an auto tune yeah. and then yeah, it'll I be mean, perfect. Right. It, there'd have to be a, a lot of auto tune to make that, uh, that palatable, I guess. I'm sure it'd be great. All right. Well, what's, what's, uh, <laughs> so, let, t- take us out with your one last thing. It's, it's this, you know, to sum up, uh, yeah, Tate's application service, it's, it's best done with this, uh, classic haiku of, Here's my source code. Run it on the cloud for me. I do not care how, and uh, that's 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 the whole kind of premise behind the platform. And I think everything we talked about that today kind of help drives that. But and, I always like saying that. And, and Nick, I'm right in saying that you have that embroidered on your pillow at, at night. Not, not yet, but I think I will, or I'll get some kind of swag or something like that. <laughs> Maybe a hat or a shirt. I don't know. It, pillow embroidery might not be the, the easiest thing to get lined up, but well, everyone I'm always sure needs a new hobby. It. Well, maybe uh, maybe we can get Ryan to uh, etch something with his laser etcher or something. So one oh. of our teammates, I think, just recently got a, a some kind of laser device that, that does etching. So maybe maybe that he might is. work. He very nearly etched his kitchen countertop <laughs> <laughs> in the unboxing excitement. You know, that, that might be handy to have like, uh, you know, um, like imperial to metric charts and then also just your imperial thing. So you can sort out what a tablespoon is relative to a pint relative to a quart and all of that. And you could just etch that on your kitchen counter and really never have to look that up again. It would just be right there. (laughs) It would be really important to get it correct though. Yes. That's that's what you want to shoot for. (laughs) Yeah, you would. You can't really roll back that if you if it go it goes wrong, right? <laughs> you well, edge the utensils. You know, it would be like those, oh, yeah. you know, this CSI when there's someone lying on the floor and there's like a thing around it. You could have that, but for for your for your knives and your spoons and your forks. Right, right. See, it all it go, all goes back to uh, having kids help you out. If you if you etch that, they would know where to put things. You can just say it's <laughs> like the the outlines that you have. Yeah. At least well, that's spe- hope, right? <laughs> yeah. Speaking of knowing where to put things and etching, it's probably etched in your mind, dear listener, that if you wanted to get this, uh, this, the show notes for this episode, you could go to tanzutalk.com. And what I always recommend is that if you haven't subscribed to it, you get, you get your, your podcast phone or computer out. And if you just search for Tanzu Talk, you can download it and subscribe to it. Also, if you have children who are putting silverware where it needs to be because you've etched it, find all of their devices and subscribe to the podcast to download it. Any love of loved ones that you have, uh, you know, partners, spouses, grandparents, friends, uh, your kids' parents as well. Just grab their phone and subscribe to the podcast episode, and I'm sure they'll they'll thank you. They'll they'll send you cards this holiday about how wonderful you've made their year by subscribing to this podcast. And with that, we'll see everyone next time. Bye bye. Bye, folks. Bye.